Welcome to E-Part Shala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Associate Professor, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Pit Pune. Today we are going to look at a series of three modules beginning with the present one called the Fundamental Concepts of Sociology of Max Weber Part 1. This is a module which comes under the paper Classical Sociological Theory. We are all familiar with Weber's understanding of an interpretativist kind of sociology, his critique of positivism, his understanding of capitalism and modernity, of how he envisioned that rationality finally would lead to a kind of disenchantment of modern society. In this module, we will study some basic concepts of social action and uh, we will also study about class, party and status. It should be remarked at the very onset of this module that there are three parts to this module, this being the first. Further, this intellectual venture will follow the chronological order as mentioned. Firstly, we discuss Weber's notion of social action, followed thereafter with his concept of social relationships. Here, a focus centers itself upon exposing his views on these notions. More in particular, we attempt to distinguish what Weber considers as social action and what is not a social action, whereof emphasizing the aspect of subjective meaning of the actor taking into account of the social milieu on which the individual dwells and acts. Similarly, when it comes to the notion of social relationship, we argue that Weber traces social action as a bridge on which social relationship is built. Indeed, Weber believes that it is the social action that facilitates social interactions through such relationships and may be of a different kind and at different levels. It is after this that we attempt to expose his views on the concepts of class, party and status. What is peculiar to all these notions that will constitute a focal point is the fact that for Weber they are all constituents of stratification of society thus all equal importance in the social life experience. The concept of social action. By social action, Weber refers to an action to use his words, quote, in so far by virtue of the subjective meaning attached to it by the acting individual or individual, it takes account of the behavior of others and is thereby oriented in its course, unquote. In other words, Weber considers an action as social action if done by an individual human person with a subjective meaning attached to it. That is, in so far as it carries and reveals the individual's behavior which in turn affects one's fellow being or society and creates a reactive response to it. However, Weber adds a warning upon which he holds that a social action is not that which is done neither out of a pressure of the others nor is it an action done out of the influence of the crowd or perhaps of a peer group. Why? It is because in such circumstances the individual acts not on the basis of subjective meaning but on the influence which lacks a subjective motive. It follows therefore that for an action to be a social one has to be voluntarily intended and by concerned actor has to carry a subjective meaning of the actor. Only then it becomes a social action and a revelation of the actor's behavior. It should be noted here that the use of the terminologies subjective meaning and understanding both in his description of sociology and in his definition of social action is no way an accidental application. This is because he distinguishes the subjective 
from the objective meaning and the application of the term understanding in natural from human sciences. As for human sciences including sociology, Weber thinks we require a subjective and not objective meaning at least as it is used in natural sciences. That is to say, he questions positivism. Similarly, just as in the case for human sciences, in sociology we use the term understanding not in terms of direct rational grasping which is mostly applicable for social sciences. Say for instance the proposition 2 into 2 is equal to 4 but in terms of explanatory or interpretative understanding this means nothing. Here the focus is paid upon seeking to understand the motives behind the individual's behavior expressed in his or her action. Secondly, the term subjective meaning denotes the intendedness of the actor in the act of performing an action. What do we mean by this? By this we mean the action is a social one in so far as the actor or the individual acts under the umbrella of an intention and meaning which is subjective. This implies that the meaning of that action will be determined by the social context in which the action is performed. Weber groups the social actions into four major types. Instrumentally rational action or zwart rational, value rational action or word rational, affective or emotional action and the traditional action. A social action is instrumentally rational or zwart rational when the purpose, the meaning of attaining the goal and its outcoming consequences are rationally considered and deliberated. Certainly, this presupposes the act of choice or free will and in turn choice always presupposes decision amidst different alternatives and at times in conflicting goals. In simple terms, the individual does an action out of the consciousness of the end result of that action, chooses the means leading to that end and its secondary consequences. One of the examples of this form of action is the modern goal for material success. Many people are moved by capitalist economy due to their end which is the material success. As a consequence of this, education is seen from the pragmatic viewpoint that is as means towards the aim goals which can be economic and material success. Nevertheless, value rational action or worth rational is an action oriented or determined by, to use Weber's word, conscious belief in the value for its own sake of some ethical, aesthetic, religious or other forms of behavior independently of its prospects of success. Here, the individual action focuses not on the end result but on the value itself, irrespective of the outcoming effect. Perhaps such value or values could be religious, moral or aesthetic. From this, we can see that Value rational action differs from instrumentality action in that the latter is based on the value itself out of which the action is done irrespective of its secondary outcomes and the former is based on deliberate choice that is freedom of the end to which the action is done and the means through which one reaches that goal while considering its secondary consequences. Unlike the former types of social actions, the emotional or effective action can be described as an action which is done out on of actor specific effects and feeling states. Here the action is primarily based on personal emotional status, example love, hatred, empathy rather than rational deliberation of its goal and means. Moreover, effective actions either be permeated by one sentiment or one's emotional tension. Similarly, they can either be governed by responsive stimulus or as a release or discharge of one's emotional state. Finally, the traditional social actions include all actions 
that persons do regardless of them being aware of it in strict sense. These are the actions done habitually irrespective of one meditating on their ends and means. In this sense, a traditional action is rooted and guided on a habit or a custom. One does them because throughout the history people have performed them and consequently there is no second thought with regard to their meaning or their goal. Due to this reason, though accepting them as part of social action, Weber remained quite skeptical to them. The concept of social relationship. When Weber speaks of social relationships, he refers to behavior of plurality of the actors, bound together by their actions, insofar as their actions manifest the social aspect. In other words, Social relationship can be traced as a product of the social actions insofar as the nature of any social action is always oriented towards the others. In principle, social relationship can be at the micro level, for example, marriage, parent-child relationship or at the macro level that is associations, churches, political parties, universities, etc. From the above insight, we draw few implications. Firstly, whether it is a micro or a macro social relationship, one thing stands common to all types of social relationships, namely that it is a social action that binds individual in the social relationship. Hence, a social action is a not or a sine qua non condition or still an ingredient without which social relationship cannot and perhaps will not exist. That is why Weber argues that whether it is marriage or state, whether it is in association or one to one relationship, social action is always a bridging factor. Types of social relationship. Moreover, social relationships can be of two major types, communal or associative. It is considered communal if the individual engages in the act of relationship, understand each other as entities who share a common understanding or common origin and membership. In this case, marriage of family can be an appropriate example of this form of relationship. Affection or love, understanding and tradition may be the key bonds to this type of social relationship. On the other hand, social relationship is considered associative if common understanding among the individuals is carried out of personal interest by means of rational agreement and mutual consensus. A typical example of this Weber offers is that of the two or more political parties and economic partnerships, wherein conflicts among them are likely to break out and perhaps quite often and a common understanding is not guaranteed on the basis of the social relationships, but on the personal interests. Here, more than love or affection, the relationship is basically rooted on rational reason, say for instance rules or laws. Based on this understanding, Weber suggested that in nature, social relations can be conflicting or hostile oriented, love or affection is based or on sexual attraction or economic ground. Moreover, it is also a fact that Weber admits that the fact that social relations can either be temporal or lasting. In the later case, relation may last within the shortage of time, whereas for the latter, the relation occurs repeatedly. In addition, Weber argues that social relationship can also be classified in terms of its openness or closeness. It is open if it is not restricted to any individuals, that is when everyone is free to join, say for example to a group, or on the contrary, it is closed when its membership and participation is restricted to certain persons or is subjective to certain conditions or rules by which one is admitted to be part of. This implies that the willingness of the individual is not the criteria to membership of closed relationships. The concept of class, status and party. As George Ritzer remarks, Weber objected to the Marxist view of 
society which advocated a monoistic understanding of the structure of society. It should be recalled that according to Marx, the basis of the social structure is the economy. It is on the grounds of economy that society was divided into two classes, namely the bourgeoisie or the dominant rich and privileged class and the proletariat or the dominated and less privileged class. In contrast to Marx, Weber advocated a multi-dimensional approach suggesting that class, status and party constitute the basis of social stratification. Therefore, that for Weber society can be analyzed in terms of class, status and party. On the concept of class, for Weber a class is formed out of a social action and there can be different types of classes. Yet, in Weber's understanding, class should not be perceived as a community, but as a group of people who share the same situation. This situation can either be economic or market or even a social one. Moreover, Weber distinguishes between three types of classes, property, commercial and social. By property class, Weber refers to a class based on property differences. This would mean that the determinant factor of this form of class is the value of the property, which in turn is determined by the consumer. It seems that Weber attempts to defend the idea that property class may be used to determine the social class. If this observation is true, then it follows that one may be grouped into high or a middle or low class depending on the property that one owns. Commercial class, on the other hand, is primarily based, to use Weber's word, on the marketability of goods and services. Based on this factor, we find in society existing privileged classes that emerge out of the marketability of their goods. The typical example of such group of people includes what Weber calls as ship owners, merchants, the owners of industries and big farms. Then we also have a group of people who are economically negatively or less privileged, for example, the workers. And lastly, we have a middle class, a group of people who lie in between the privileged economic class and negatively economically privileged class. The public and private officials are a clear example of this later case. Social class is the sum of all mentioned class situations. Due to this reason, Weber gives us four major social classes, namely the working class. By working class, probably Weber meant the proletariats or workers. The second is what they call petty bourgeoisie. By petty bourgeoisie, Weber seems to mean those who precede the working class at the hierarchical level. The third is what he calls propertyless intelligentsia and specialists. This class includes the civil servants who are socially considered with due respect, technicians, bureaucrats, civil servants among others. The fourth is he calls the class as privileged in and through property and education. This would include a class of people who are well off both intellectually and economically. On the concept of status, according to Weber, status is a social concept which denotes a particular style of life of individual or individuals. More concretely, it refers to social order in that it denotes a social estimation of honor, which can either be positive or negative. It should be cleared out that for some, for Weber, it is not the economic qualification which determines one's social status, though at some point it may be important or contribute or lead to it. Instead, primarily it is a person's lifestyle or sometimes the hereditary factors determining one's social status. As Weber claims sociologically, status evokes nothing but the idea of social stem. It can be of two types, individual status and status group. It is individual when the social stem is affirmed to a particular individual, say for example one person, whereas status group denotes social stem affirmed to a group of individuals, say for example a particular family or class. Moreover, status group can be based on the group's lifestyle or on traditional hierarchy. The concept of party, from the study done on Weber's views on class and status, it certainly is sensible and arguably that class and status belong to the economic and social orders respectively. 
However, this is not the case with parties. For Weber, as per Ritzer's analysis, parties belong or can be found in political order. Therefore, talking about party or parties is to enter into a field of politics. What is particular and peculiar to political parties is which in turn serves as the main characteristics is the craving for power and domination, the result of which is the infinite focus to power acquisition. It may be worth noting, though Weber's approach on party seems to be negative, he claims that parties are the most organized structures of society. To conclude, we have seen how Weber defines social action and how he thinks it is so important to bring about agency in society. He also understands how power is defined in society and how status groups are very important also uh, and how class becomes an important category. Unlike Marx, he differs in his conception of class also. Finally, these concepts enable us to understand how he provides for an alternative interpretativist kind of sociology.